Hello stats learners, it's your stats professor Christina Knutson and this video will tell you a little bit about sampling distributions. So imagine that you go out and you conduct some kind of survey and calculate the proportion of people who um, perhaps support a particular candidate. And then another person goes out and conducts the same survey looking at the same proportion um, as their goal. You're not going to get the exact same numbers. So maybe you'll find 21% of people support the candidate and maybe your friend will find 23% of people support the candidate. And that doesn't mean that either of you did anything wrong. It just means that there is variability because you're just looking at a sample and not the entire population. So it's pretty intuitive that something like a sample proportion or sample mean or sample standard deviation would vary from sample to sample because you're not going to have the exact same people or dogs or whatever in your samples. So what that means is we have differences um, in those sample statistics from sample to sample. That means that we have to think about like, where is this centered? Where is the sample statistic centered? how much variability is there, what does its distribution look like. So we can look at these sorts of things by looking at the sampling distribution of a sample statistic. And um, there's kind of two ways that you can think about um, understanding sampling distributions. One way is to um, use the more theoretical route, like maybe look at moment generating functions, central limit theorems, that sort of thing. Um, in this video, first, we're going to use R to develop more of like a conceptual understanding of sampling distributions. So first thing that we'll think about is maybe um, a sample mean. We want to look at the sampling distribution for a sample mean. So maybe let's draw some data. So we can maybe draw some Poisson data. And we can look at question mark D Poiss to um, see how this works. And actually, um, this has the documentation for DPOS, PPOS, QPOS, RPOS. And um, it tells you different things, like DPOS gives you the density of the Poisson distribution, RPOS will um, generate some random numbers from a Poisson distribution. And that's the one we're going to use today, RPOS. Let's choose n equals 10. Uh, let's just choose n equals 1 and then lambda equals 7. And then this will generate um, a random number from a Poisson distribution with mean 7. OK, so we see how the RPOS works. If we changed this to 3, n equals 3, then it would give us three random numbers. And if we change, well, that one looked weird. Let's do another one. OK, these are different numbers, 6, 7, and 9. OK, so let's go ahead and um, now save this as something. So I'll just save this as temp. And let's set the seeds so that we can have reproducible results. OK, so temp ends up being 488. Let's look at the mean. So the sample mean based on this sample of size 3 is 6.66. Okay, so we said that we want to understand the variability and where um, the sample mean is centered as we go from sample to sample. So what we're going to do now is draw a whole bunch of samples from the same distribution with the same sample size, and we're going to look at the um, variability, the center, all that stuff. So let's um, make an empty vector. Let's just fill it with um, zeros. And let's choose how many repetitions should we do? Maybe 10 to the 4. OK, so if we look at out now, it's just full of zeros. OK, let's set the um, for loop up. So for i and 1, 1 through m, what are we going to do? We're going to draw a sample of size n. And for now, let's set n to be maybe 5 from a Poisson distribution with lambda equals 7. OK, so that will be our first step. Second step will be calculate and store the mean of the sample. 
Okay, so we saw how to do this first part before. So we um, draw the sample of size n from a Poisson 7 with this command here. And let's change this to n equals n so that, and I defined n outside on outside here so that we can like change that later. And let's actually um, make lambda a variable too. Okay, so that will um, create our sample of size n from a Poisson distribution with lambda as the mean. And then we're going to calculate and store the mean in the ith entry of out. Okay. And then once that's all done, let's look at a histogram of those means. Okay, so that goes ahead, it runs, creates the plot down here, and here is our histogram of those means. So we have m equals 10 to the 4 different um, samples of size n equals 5, all taken from a lambda distribution with mean 7. And so this is what its sampling distribution looks like. So this is a histogram of all the sample means that we got. Let's, um, for funsies, change n to a bigger number. Let's make this 15 and see if it changes much. Okay, so now we can see it looks a little bit smoother, I think. And just to make it really apparent, let's um, change n again, maybe make it really big. And maybe it will look even better. Ah, yes, looking so smooth, it's looking very normal. And let's just go to the other extreme. Let's just take a sample of size. Let's do two. So now we're just collecting two data points and taking the mean. And that is what our um, histogram of the sample means would look like. Okay, so um, this is giving us an idea of that sampling distribution. Let's do a similar thing, but now with a proportion. Okay, so um, let's again create this vector out. Let's also take... Um, m to be 10 to the 4. And then now we're going to use our binome. And let's look at that documentation. So for our binome, we give it n. Um, so um, we give it n and then the size and the probability. So let's do an example to see what this means. So if I just want to have um, one binomial random variable with um, five trials and prob equals one half, then there we go. This will tell us I have one success. Let's do another one. This says I have four successes. Another one tells me I have three successes, three successes, three successes, three successes. Okay, so that's just for a binomial random variable, a single one, and if I wanted to have two binomial random variables, each with five trials and probability a half, I could change this first argument to two. And so then it would say the first binomial random variable has a value of three. The second binomial random variable has a value of three. If I do it again, it, this says the first binomial random variable has a value of four. The second one has a value of two. Okay, so we can go ahead and create another one of these um, loops. Let's, uh, oops set up a couple more things. So let's make n maybe four for now. Let's make the probability 0.25 perhaps. And then we can set up our loop. So for i in one through m, and let's break down what our steps are. So draw from a binomial random variable 
or draw from a binomial distribution with n and probability. And um, then let's store the sample proportion. So if we go back here um, and divide this by five, this gives us the sample proportion of successes. So in this particular one, we have 40% successes. If we do it again, 40% successes. Again, 0% successes. 20% successes. So these are our sample proportions. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw from our binomial distribution. Let's just take one at a time and we want to have size equals n and probability equals 0.25, which we set to be, um, which we called prob earlier. So we do one of those, oops, we need to run this. Okay, so that's our number of successes. Maybe let's call this n success. And then we can divide that by n to get the proportion of successes. So n success over n is 0.25 for this case where we have one success out of the four. So let's go ahead and run this. Let's set the seed. So we are again iter uh, repeatedly sampling from a binomial distribution with um, four trials for each and um, a probability of success 0.25. And so this is our histogram of the potential um, p hats that we could get, the sample proportions that we could get. So there we go. We can see we could have 0%, 20%, um, or rather 25%, 50%, or 75%. Let's um, try this again, and instead of having just four, let's have 40 and see what happens to our sampling distribution. So as we increased the number of trials, then our histogram, our sampling distribution smooths out a lot. And if we um, kept increasing it, it would get smoother and smoother. So let's do another one, this time with 400, and see what happens. So before we do 400, we'll notice that um, the mean is at about 25%, and it looks like maybe we have a little bit of skew. If we do this again with 400, I'm going to guess that it's going to be better centered. Yeah, there we go. So now it's centered more clearly at 0.25, and it's looking a lot more symmetric. There's less skew. So some conclusions, as we increase our sample size, then um, our histograms are going, our sampling distributions will be smoother, more symmetric, more normal looking. And if we want to look at like the mean of our hit, um, samples, we could look at mean out to see here's where our um, histogram is centered at a point at about 0.25 and if we look at SD of out we'd have um, a standard deviation for our sample proportion of 0.02 and this standard deviation of a sample statistic has a special name it's called the standard error so we can say the standard error of the mean or the standard error of the um, proportion. So standard error is the special word for standard deviation of a sampling distribution. Okay, so we'll get some more practice with this in um, future videos building on this. For now, that's it.